Hi, I'm so happy to join you. Thank you so much, Miriam and Chris, for putting this on. This is amazing. So uh, I'm so excited that we could still experience Quito, Utah, even though I'm doing it from California right now. So I'm Kim Howerton, and I am a keto coach. So what is a keto coach sometimes comes up? What is a coach at all? Because so often our only experience uh, when we're growing up it's of a coach is a sports coach. And so we know what that is. And then often, you know, in the world, you'll hear someone say that they're a coach. And quite honestly, a lot of us have some sort of thoughts like, well, that's kind of hokey. Why do you need a coach? Why do you need a life coach? Why do you, you know, why do you need that? So I thought I would go into that a little bit to, I don't know, validate myself, right? So let's talk about my favorite parable. So this is the parable of the whole. So say one day you're walking down the street and all of a sudden, whoops, you didn't see that there were some leaves obscuring a hole and you slip in and you're now in the bottom of this old well and the sides are slick and you can't get out and you're really scared and frustrated. And somebody comes by and they look in the hole and they say, don't worry, I am a doctor. And you're like, oh, thank you so much. I need to get out of this hole. And the doctor says, well, it really does appear that the moss on that, on that hole, you're getting like a reaction to that. So got a little rash. So I'm going to give you this prescription and it's going to fix that. And he drops a prescription down the hole and he walks off and you're like, uh, okay, well, hopefully somebody else will come by. And then somebody does. And they say, Hey, uh, I see you're in this hole. And you're like, yes, please, can you help me? And they say, I'm a teacher. Um, let me tell you about the age of the limestone of this very interesting um, well you seem to be in. It is a historical monument. And you're like, okay, great, that's super. I feel you know, special that I'm in this special well, but I, I just really need to get out. And they're like, well, I will find you some resources on that and, and come back. So you're like, oh, that's not gonna work. So then somebody else comes by and they say, I'm a therapist. And you're like, great, can you help me? Can you help me get out? And the therapist says, you know, I really, I see that this is, this is troubling. I see this is a problem. I, I really, I can feel your anxiety. I can, I can feel that transmitting from the hole. And I would like to talk to you about your relationship with being in the hole. And you're like, um, I can see that that is going to be very helpful. Maybe one day when I'm out of the hole, and I, but right now I I just have to get out. And then a coach walks up, and they look up, and this person is kind of losing hope because so far, you know, though all these people were very helpful, they didn't actually help with the problem. And before you could even say anything the coach has jumped into the hole with you. And you're like, what kind of a moron are you? What, I was in the hole and now we're in the hole. What, this doesn't make any sense. And the coach says, don't worry, I've been in this hole before and I know how to get out. So to me, the, the thing about being a coach is I know where my clients have been and I work with them on getting free of where they don't wanna be anymore. So I've been a coach for over a decade. I was actually a coach before I found keto. Um, I was in my own sort of a hole. Oh, look, I'm wearing the same shirt. I own other shirts. Um, I was in a hole of you know my own making and I couldn't figure out how to get out. I worked on all sorts of areas of my life, but over and over again, I was like, I was just stuck. I was stuck in this place where I was fighting my body and I was fighting my habits and I was just fighting every day to survive. And I was just miserable and I had to make a change. And when I found keto and was able to put a bunch of pieces together, I actually was able to initiate the kind of changes that I really needed. And so I wanna talk to you today about how those pieces come together and how as a coach, I use some of my coaching skills to create a path that allows lasting change. So where did the phrase coach even come from? Well, I'm kind of giving it away, right? 
So the first known use of the word coach in the context of what I'm talking about, and that I am a coach, I'm not actually a trolley car or anything like that, um, is that we had coaches. They were the way we got from place to place before we had automobiles. And so the first use of the word coach in terms of the job that I do was described in the late 1800s at Oxford University. This is at least the first known instance. Now, up until that point, we had very much had tutors. But in this time, in this writing, somebody referred to a person as a coach because they helped them pass their exams. They hired this person with the specific intent of helping them pass their exams. They weren't like teaching them. They weren't a tutor. They were a coach. There was a goal. So a coach is designed, I mean, what, what, a, what a coach does is they help to get you from where you are to where you want to be. So you have a goal and that goal is your destination. It's where you want to go. So we have a game plan, right? And you know, Anyone who knows anything about like military history or, or strategy knows kind of how this works. You have a goal and then from the goal, you develop a strategy and then from the strategy, you develop tactics. So that's kind of how you lay out what you're going to do. So let's say that you want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, right? So that's your goal to reach the summit. You're going to need a strategy. So that strategy is gonna be, you know, which side of the mountain am I gonna climb and at what time of year so that I avoid, you know, the snow. Can you avoid the snow? Anyway, you know, so you're 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 putting all those pieces together to develop this sort of broad strategy. And then you drill down a layer and you're like, these are my tactics. I'm gonna, you know, pack my bag this way and I'm gonna hire these people. So each one of those little tactics. So uh, strategy is like the big picture goal is the destination and tactics are like tactical. They're, they're the tools, they're the things that you're gonna do on the local level, right? In yourself with other people, you're doing the tactics to get to the strategy. So as a definition, a strategy is a comprehensive plan of action designed to achieve a major or overall aim, right? So that makes sense. So if we are, uh, you know, going keto, well, keto is our strategy. Now notice it says, comprehensive plan of action, right? So uh, the word comprehensive is important there. You know, going keto, You, if you know what you mean when you say going keto, then that's your strategy. But for a lot of people, you have to really define what that means. So it might mean um, going high fat, low carb, intermittent fasting keto. It might mean higher protein, moderate fat, you know, however you wanna really define what keto means, but that strategy should be comprehensive. It should include exactly the way that you're going about things. But this is not a, you know, this is not a, a, a book. A strategy is, is a statement or a couple of sentences. It's short, it's, but it, is, it does include enough detail that you know, right? Because uh, if your goal is fat loss and your strategy is a specific way you're gonna keto, then now you're laying that out in a successful way. But if your goal was weight loss and your strategy was keto, but you hadn't really defined what keto meant to you or in your life, then that's a little wonky. So you have to make sure you understand all the parts of your strategy. And then tactics are planned actions that support and advance your strategy. So that's kind of how you lay it out. So, I mean, this makes total sense. All you logical people are like, yes, that makes total sense. And then it's really important that each one of these pieces are in alignment. So this is Sun Tzu. Strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory, but tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat, right? You can't just say, I'm going keto and everything will be fixed. You have to have tactics involved. You have to know like on the sort of the, the hands-on level what that's gonna look like. So you're thinking strategically and you're acting tactically but let's get practical because people, they get stuck. I'm like, I've laid out this very clear plan, right? You know what to do. And like, before you start something, you're like, this is so clear. I mean, I have a goal. If I know my goal, I just focus on my goal and I achieve my goal. 
And while some of us may have experienced that in other areas of our life, there are always going to be areas that this does not work, right? Like you can't just sometimes for some things, for some of you, you pointed your nose in a direction and you just went, you just went after it and you got it. And that was true of me in a lot of areas of my life, but I never managed it in the area of my weight, right? And I was exceedingly frustrated by that fact and I couldn't figure it out. But, but we get stuck and this happens. And so for, for me, it was my weight. For somebody else, it might be their career, right? We all have these, these roadblocks and we're like, well, why is, why? Because it's so clear if I have strategy and I have tactics, I should achieve my goal. But the reality is we are not blank slates. We are a collection of habits, right? We came with baggage. Right. We are full of these habits. These habits take up all the room that is us. So a habit is a routine or practice performed regularly. It's an automatic response to a specific situation. So if you show me your habits, I know who you are is basically you'll hear that sometimes because we are this collection of habits. And for a lot of us, in the area where we're hitting that roadblock, where we're finding that struggle, the habits that we have are blocking the road. They're blocking our way from our goal because those habits don't point towards our goal. We're on autopilot. And if you're on autopilot, which is normal, we live on autopilot, right? If you're on autopilot, but your car, you have programmed into your GPS, not your house, because your your habits, what you do, what actions you take, those autopilot you towards your destination. If you've not entered the right destination, the autopilot is trying to take care of you. It's doing what you trained it to do, but you're not getting where you want to go. So until you can make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. That's Carl Jung. Um, yes, I was a psych major. Um, so basically the step that people miss when they're working out their strategy and their tactics is that you're not a blank slate. You have unconscious direction in your life that, that manifest as habits that need to be retrained so you don't stay stuck in the identity that does not serve you anymore. This is James Clear. He said, we do not rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our system. Tactics are systems. So I'm going to try and keep this all relatable. So tactics are systems. And those systems keep your habits on track. So when we perform a behavior over and over and over again, as we do with habits, they become automatic. We go on autopilot. Um, And then that autopilot, you know, it wears a rut in the road. And then we just keep driving that road. We keep, we stay in that rut. We stay on that track. So when we create tactics, what we're doing is we're saying, I'm making the unconscious conscious and I'm creating new tactics. I'm creating new systems that are going to keep my preferred habits on track and reduce the habits that take me to the old track. I'm creating a new road. So I suggest doing a bit of a habit audit, um, which is basically looking at the habits we have that are not serving us so that we can make room for the systems that we need to put in place to create the new habits that are directed towards our goal. So everything we do, every habit we have, moves us either towards or away from that new goal that we have. We've set this goal to move us towards it or away from it. Now, I mean, there are obviously unrelated actions you take in the world that might be neutral, but whenever you're in this arena of thought, you know, it's either towards or away. So maybe you feel like you don't know what your habits are. Well, I would say look at your results. Your current results are created by your current habits. So you might look at your life right now and say, what outcomes am I getting? 
what things are happening that I don't want to happen in the arena of my goal? What are the things that are kind of the opposite of my goal? Right. And so often when people come to a life change, like they decided to get healthy or lose weight or any of those kind of health related topics, usually they're moved by either one of two uh, motivations. They're either moved by inspiration or desperation. And I have to say that most people really, when they're making a big life change that feels really hard, it's desperation. They desperately don't want what they have. They desperately don't want to be fat anymore. They desperately want to be healthy. They don't want to have this health problem, right? And that that is clear. I, I don't, so, you know, as an example, someone might say, I don't want to weigh 300 pounds anymore. They do now and they don't want that anymore. Okay, what are the habits that have gotten you there? Those are the things we need to focus on unwinding to make room for the new. Because the reality is, as desperate as you might feel, that desperation is a catalyst. It can move you towards creating a new goal, creating new systems, new tactics, all of that. But on the day to day, living in the negative, living in the I don't want doesn't happen. We don't, I don't, we do. We do things, right? Even not doing things is doing something because you're doing something else. You're doing something instead. So desire lives in the positive, not the negative. So that's why when we live in that place where we just think how much about all the things in our life that we don't want, we tend not to get traction. But you can evaluate what you don't want to look at the actions that are still in your life, the habits that no longer serve you. So, you know, why do we even develop these bad habits is a question that a lot of people might might have. And I think it's it's good to look at. So I just said bad habits, right? Because we judge the habit as bad. The habit itself is usually not bad. It's that we don't like the result of this habit, right? We, like I just said, we trace it backwards. What are you getting that you don't want? So you judge the outcome, you judge the result of this habit, but your habit was created to serve you in some way. So usually when we develop a habit, it's to solve an immediate problem. So it's an unconscious development. So once upon a time in your life, if you are somebody that binge eats, as an example, so if you are someone that binge eats, you probably developed that as a solution to a problem. And at the time, it was the best solution you could come up with. I think a lot of these actually develop for us in childhood when, you know, eating is soothing. You know, we come from, you know, being a baby and eating is the only way that we could get soothing uh, at a certain level at certain times. And so we have this association and that association persists that eating is comfort. And so there were times in our life potentially where there was a painful situation of some kind, you know, whether that was simply you had anxiety or something was going on you didn't like, and you didn't have the resources to address that issue directly and consciously. So you did something to bring you comfort, which alleviated the, the, the intensity of the experience you were having. And then time after time after time, you had a short term solution of eating when you had a problem, you know, an emotional feeling came up and then that became a habit. And so I have so many clients who are so upset with themselves because they can't figure out why they can't stop X. And it's usually eating, right? Um, and they're like, I, you know, I focus on my why, I focus on my goal, I, you know, I do all these things and I just can't seem to stop myself. And the thing is, you have to actually make the unconscious conscious. You have to say, that is a habit I developed to serve me, it's no longer serving me. It's a short-term fix and it's created a long-term problem, right? 
but we're terrible at long-term problem solving. We, we're not wired that way. It's just not human to uh, think long-term over short-term. We like instant gratification. We like the now. And so this is a real challenge. So most people's habits that are no longer serving them, though I will occasionally say bad habits because it's just how we talk, but I want you to question if it's really bad or just not moving you towards your goal. So, but most short-term solutions are at the expense of our long-term. And so we have to think about that. And that's why it's so important to set that goal because it sets a parameter and then that strategy and then those tactics. We're moving in a direction of consciousness and moving away from unconsciousness in this time. Because, you know, when you're on autopilot and you're just going to the place you've always gone, well, that's fine. But now you're saying, I want something to be different. I want a different destination. So what do you do? You have to become conscious of the route and be aware and focus on this change. So that's why having that goal and strategy in mind is so important when you're making this shift. So most often when I ask people who are trying to um, you know, make a change, how they're going to do it, how they, what they plan on using as their tactic, they say, I am going to rely on willpower. And you're like, great, what does that mean? And they don't maybe know. So let's break down willpower. Willpower, is the control exerted to restrain impulses. So it's like an inner control. And, but I wanna kind of introduce you to willpower. So this guy, he's willpower. So willpower is this friend who promises you a lot. You know, when you're planning something, willpower is like, I have got you. I'm renting a truck for your move. We're going to we're going to do it together. You know what? You're just going to rest. I'm going to do it all. I'm going to bring in a crew. Like will will is full of promises. But the day arrives when you need to move, when you really need him and you're ready to go and you're tired and you're hungry and you're frustrated and you pick up the phone and you're like, "Will, I need you." And Will says, mm, "I'd love to, but you know, I got some things going on and I'm kind of busy. There's a lot, you know, there are a lot of things and I'm a busy guy. And so willpower is not there for you when you need them. And that is true of willpower and willpower because willpower is a flake. So willpower is a limited resource. And if there's anything going on, it takes power away from your from your will, your ability to just resist through force of will. And so what do we tend to be when we are making a health change? We might feel frustrated. We might feel disappointed. We might feel tired. We might feel hungry. We might feel any number of things. All of these things degrade our willpower. So never depend on something that isn't dependable and willpower is not. Like I'm not saying it doesn't exist and it's not a thing sometimes, but it's really about promises and it, it, it doesn't always follow through. You can't depend on it. I wanna talk about self-sabotage because this comes up all the time. I mentioned it a little earlier, but let's go into it a little deeper because I have clients who get so frustrated because they just can't understand why they can't do what they know they want to do. They know they want to change. They believe they want to change. And they blame themselves that they can't make it happen. So here's what happens. This is just humanity. This is just who, you, who we are. Humans don't like pain. I know that's crazy, but it's true. We don't like to be in pain and we will sacrifice the long term to alleviate pain very often. So can we ever not do that? Can we ever prioritize the long term over the short term? Yes, we have that ability. We could do that, but it's very, very difficult. And the motivation has to be very, very strong. And 
just like willpower, motivation is a little bit iffy, right? So when we focus on the negative, when we have negative self-talk, right? Because that's what always happens, right? You're like, why can I never do this? I'm I'm lazy, I'm weak, I'm, you know, fill in the blank, whatever name somebody used to call you in third grade. Um, you know, you're like, it's just who I am. My identity is a loser. And when we engage in this negative self-talk, we will just try for pain avoidance because the short term we're experiencing is so difficult and so painful that we're gonna reach for a solution that fixes not the problem we feel bad about, but simply the feeling bad. And so I want to talk to you, cause I'm you, this was me, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not different, right? You cannot afford to indulge in negative self-talk because it reinforces behaviors that reinforce habits that cause you to fail. We think we deserve to be mean to ourselves, right? There's some place in our head that we think we catch a glimpse of ourselves in the mirror and we don't like what we see. And we start this sort of path of self-recrimination. And then we drive home how worthless we are. And then that reinforces the short-term pain avoiding habits. So you just need to tell yourself, and I say just like it's easy, but you need to tell yourself that you can't afford this, that you cannot afford to live here. You need to focus on the practical and not the emotional. And I get it, like I honor the emotional, I respect the emotional, the emotional is real, it is not helping you. And so we need to, whenever that comes up, that feeling, that negative self-talk, whatever those patterns are within you, like you don't have to fight with them. You don't have to pretend to be happy. You don't have to pretend anything, but you say, okay, I'm gonna focus on real and practical and actions, and I'm not gonna stay in this negative self-talk. Because, Every action you take casts a vote for who you will become. That's James Clear again. He has a book on habits, so he's very useful in this area, and I can definitely recommend it. I actually have it somewhere. It's called Atomic Habits. Anyway, so look that book up. But so here's the reality. When you're in this place where you don't like who you are, you don't like who you've become, all you have to focus on is the fact that your habits are causing that person to exist, right? So you don't have to focus on who you are. You have to focus on your habits. So that's what I mean by staying practical. Because if you can replace your current habits that take you down the wrong road with habits that take you down the right one, you will stone by stone, brick by brick, uh, inch by inch, be recreating your identity in the form of the person that matches your goal. And it's done just little by little by little. And a habit can seem so basic and so minor, but you are the collection of your habit. Systems are the training wheels. So when we're making the unconscious conscious and we're bringing these habits into the light and taking them off of autopilot, you're creating systems that prioritize the new habits over the old habits. Now, as I said before, desire operates in the positive. It's hard to stop doing something. It's easier to start doing something different. So you can let the new habits crowd out the old habits, but you need to know what you're doing. That's a conscious pattern. So as an example, you might, cre you might often fall into the habit of stopping at the fast food place on your way to work to pick up breakfast, right? Or you get a certain type of froofy coffee drink because it's right there by the office. Well, you can create a system that's going to alter that habit. So that might look like I pack my lunch. And what, what system would that require? Well, it would require the night before I plan my lunch 
I pack my lunch, I have it ready to go, and I have a post-it note on the front door so I don't forget it, right? You've created a system, that's the training wheels, to create a new habit because creating a new habit is, is hard because it's not your habit. You have a different habit. You have to replace that habit. So you're gonna need extra strong systems to reinforce the new habit until it takes over the old one, until it becomes automatic, until it becomes autopilot. So we are doing two things. We are increasing the friction on things that we don't want to be doing and decreasing the friction on things that we do want to be doing. So what I mean by friction, right? You, you know, like what friction is, it's, it's the rub, right? So um, when, when there's friction, it slows us down, right? We say like, uh, if a car is very aerodynamic, it has very low friction, right? The air is not slowing that car down as much as another car. It's, it's, uh, so it'll go faster and it will go easier. So we're reducing the friction, but we can also increase the friction by um, creating more drag and slowing us down. I'm not a car expert. Um, so let's talk about a habit we want to increase the friction on. So we don't want to go to that coffee shop because they have that coffee cake that we really like. And when we go in there, it's almost impossible for us to not get it. But we can go to this other one because they don't carry that coffee cake, right? So we want to increase the friction for the first shop and decrease the friction about the second shop. So what can we do to do that? Well, we can drive a different route, right? We're we're picking actions that make us more likely to do the thing we want to do. Change the route, uh, change the pattern of your day. Again, like I said earlier, you can bring your lunch. You can just go to no coffee shops whatsoever. So, but every time you're looking at your habits, you need to know, is this a habit I wanna increase the friction on or is this one I wanna decrease the friction on? And systems are what's going to do that. Putting those systems in place is the friction controller in your life. So how do we do that? What is this friction control system? Well, we're gonna get happy. What does that mean? So it's an acronym, so I love them. Uh, so the first one is habitat. So habitat, habitat, where you live, the, the world that surrounds you, habitat is your uh, environment, right? But happy wasn't a word. So habitat is your environment. You're creating the environment around you, the way you drive to and from work the way you drive to your mom's house, like everything around you, the, the course you're creating. Um, how is your kitchen laid out if you're trying to change the way you eat, right? Um, if it, this was about work, it might be your office layout. So everything's gonna come into play depending on what specific goal you're talking about. Notice what I'm talking about today, it could apply to any goal, but obviously we're specifically talking about in, in the framework of keto today, but just the skills are, multi applicable. But your habitat, your kitchen, even just down to like the cabinet, when I open the cabinet, what's at eye level? Um, you know, if you live with other people, and they have kind some kinds of food that you don't eat, how is the cabinet arranged to best support you? Um, speaking of those people, it's the people in your life. Habitat also includes your social connections. You know, is your whole house keto? Uh, or low carb or not, you know, what what rules do you set up about what kinds of foods are, are going to be in your house? How do you engage in those conversations about how that's going to work? I keep looking over there because my kitchen's over there. I'm very, very uh, oriented towards it. Um, it's also social groups that maybe you form. So maybe you join a keto meetup, maybe you join an online club, you know, maybe you don't have as many supportive people in your daily life. So you find those people somewhere else. Maybe you join a gym, you want to increase the contact that you have with people that are the new normal, that people that would be friends with the person you're creating by changing your identity through your shifting habits. And there are probably people in your life right now who that's a bit at odds with. I am not telling you you have to drop everyone in your life or you have to quit your job. You know, I'm not telling you this has to be any violent thing, 
but you are on a journey and you need to shift that habitat, which might mean shifting the way you relate to these people or places in your life, how you encounter them. So you are consciously creating a habitat that supports this change. Again, with that increasing and decreasing of friction. Anchor. So A is for anchor. So you are anchoring these new habits. What does that mean? You could also say it's like hook. Again, wrong letter for an acronym, but you're hooking onto this, um, this new habit. Because sometimes thinking of a new habit, like maybe included in who you are and your goals and your strategy, and you're like, I'm going to be somebody that works out. That might be a little intimidating. But first, you're going to anchor the habit. What does that mean? Well, what's the easiest thing you can do that moves you in that direction on that specific habit? So maybe it's putting on your tennis shoes and planning to walk for two minutes. Two minutes, okay? Just two minutes. Like literally, it might not take you past your driveway. But every day, you put your shoes on, you go out the door, and you walk for two minutes. That is an anchor because you know who you are at the end of the week? You're a person who has walked every day this week. That is a, a piece of your new identity, right? Your new identity built on your new habits. The next one is progress. So you've anchored that skill. You've anchored that habit. Now you get to progress. So, you know, you don't have to do this fast, but you start with that two minutes and you're like, hey, I did that every day for a month. Take your time. You do you right? But eventually you're going to be like, well, this is silly. I'm not turning around and, and walking back into the house. I'm going to go another minute or two. I'm going to progress. I'm going to advance this skill. I'm going to keep going a bit. And then you progress that habit to be from somebody who walks two minutes a day to somebody who walks four, eight, 12, 16, you know, you just keep going. And then you might add on, you might layer, you're creating progress in the area of this habit. The next P is personalize. So this is your journey. You are making this yours. You are creating this new identity that is built on your new habits. And you're not like, it's not like an assumed identity. You're not fake it till you make it, right? You're not like, my new name is, you know, you're not, you're not designing this person and then like just stepping into the role. You're actually becoming this person. And you should like this person. Like a lot of us, I think we might like future vision. We dream, we think, we are like, I would like to be that person. And it's somebody that's really foreign almost. Like we look, you know, you might look at somebody and be like, to be her, that would be amazing. Right? But you're you. And there are a lot of things about you that are amazing and wonderful and should be encouraged and supported and keep the things that make it you just create the habits that make you the you you most want to be. So what does that look like? What does that mean? What does that even mean, Kim, right? So, you know, when you're going on your walk and you're lacing up your shoes, get the pink shoes if you like pink. If you don't like pink, don't get pink. But, you know, do the little things that make your new habits feel really good to who you're becoming that they make it feel like uniquely yours. So personalize all of your new habits. And then yes is the why. Yes is for celebrate. So we're terrible at celebrating our wins. We focus on what could be better, right? We like we got a 95 and we focus on the one question we missed on the test. Don't do that. Remember, it's it's there's progress was one of the earlier steps. The the hidden second part of progress is not perfection. You don't have to get it perfect. You just have to make progress. But we're celebrating here. Yes, you did it. Yes, you're on the road. Yes, this is happening. You notice that when we were creating goals, we were focused on outcomes, right? What we talked about coaching, coaching is about getting you where you want to go. It's a destination. It, it's, a, it's a place. It's a thing, right? It's, it's an outcome. But we don't outcome. This is going back to that short-term, long-term. So actions are short-term. 
outcomes are long-term. When we focus on creating actions, we get happy and we create these actions that, cre that are habits that support, that are based in heading towards the identity that, that lives the life that has our goal. When we focus on the outcomes, we have no short-term thing to celebrate that yes, what are you gonna, yes, you're not there. You're going there, you're not there yet. But you can yes that you put your shoes on. You can yes that you took that action. So you're focused wholly on your actions. You're celebrating your actions. You're not wasting your time uh, rewarding or punishing yourself over outcomes. So outcomes are at the start, which is weird because it's outcome, but you use the outcome you desire to create the roadmap that includes the actions that will then again, get you to that outcome. But day to day, if you focus on where you are with relationship to that outcome, how far are you? There's like a yardstick in your mind. It will lead you into that thing you cannot afford, that blame and self-doubt and recrimination, right? We're staying out of that bad neighborhood. We're focusing on actions. Actions are clear. Actions are practical. Did I walk today? Yes or no? If the answer is no, there's still time, right? So you can focus on the actions, not the outcomes. And then I want to offer you one other thing. Don't ever forget momentum matters. We are going in a direction. So we're creating momentum. Motivation gets you started. Motivation is the push on the swing. Motivation totally matters. It doesn't see you through in the way that momentum will. So use momentum to make it easier. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. Use the steps together. Use the habits. You know, keep going. Don't skip a day. If you skip one, don't skip two, right? Don't let yourself get out of momentum because you'll need to push again. You'll need to push that motivation. It's gonna be harder. You can do it, but don't constantly need that. Don't rely on things that are unreliable. Don't rely on willpower. Don't rely on motivation. There are gonna be days you don't feel motivated, but you can rely on your habits. And then you will like who you see when you look in the mirror not because you lost the weight, but because day after day after day, you proved to yourself that you could do it. You could take action. You could change your habits. You could live the life you wanted to live because every day your new habits have helped you recreate the identity of the person that you hold in such high esteem. So thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope that was helpful. Again, I really recommend the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. And if you have any questions, you can find me at kimhowardson.com and I am here to help. So please let me know. Thanks so much. And thank you, Chris and Miriam for having me. All right, so Kim, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, a lot of times when we're talking about making changes with our lives, keto diets, whatnot, we focus a lot on the, I guess, the mechanics of it the yeah. what to eat, not the how and why to get it into your brain and change things. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for talking about that. Um, now, first off, um, do you have any disclosures? Like, did you write any awesome books that people needed to know about? <laughs> I should have wrote a book, Chris. I what mean, the heck? <laughs> I know. Um, no, then you could have afforded I... more than one shirt. I know, I know. Anyway, I um no, I I do teach and coach. Okay. I have a coaching practice and I see clients and I run groups uh, and I have cookbooks. So I have all sorts of things available on the internet, um, none of which were mentioned in today's presentation. That's okay. <laughs> now, now where can people go to find out more about you and the work that you're doing and, and all of that sort of stuff? Because I suspect a lot of people are going to listen to this and they're like, ah, I need Kim in my life. Need more. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can find me at kimhowerton.com on okay. the interwebs. 
And all of my social medias are at the Ketonist, T-H-E-K-E-T-O-N-I-S-T. Okay. And you do a lot of stuff on Facebook as well, right? I do. I do a weekly Tuesday night live on okay. my Facebook page. Nice. Uh, what time is that at, by the way? It is currently at 5 p.m. Pacific time on Tuesday evenings. Okay. So that would be 8 p.m. Eastern. I can. It would be. I, I can do maths. <laughs> We we in learned in the middle it. of the country it gets confusing because sometimes know, you're on this and then the mountain and the yeah. <laughs> we we learned not too long ago that it's I think it's forty eight percent of the U S population is in the eastern time zone. Really? Yeah, and six percent is in mountains. So <laughs> whenever we tell people when stuff is, I'm like, I realize that you can't do math and everything is New York time for you, but here you go. It's on a silver platter. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um. Now, uh, let's see. Okay, Atomic Habits. Miriam yeah. has been going on and on and on about Atomic Habits for the last several months. Yeah, good book. So, yeah, so much so that we actually bought some and just uh, did a giveaway. Oh, uh, nice. No connection with the author. Miriam just thinks the, uh, the book is fantastic. So um, it was. it's funny that she wasn't watching this when you uh, referenced that <laughs> because she would have been like, ha, ha, ha. anyway. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, I didn't want to put two quotes in from the same book, but I couldn't avoid it. So there nope. were actually two quotes from that book <laughs> in That's the presentation. Awesome. Yeah. Now, when, when you were talking about, okay, so binge eating, it's yeah. caused by something. Um, mm -hmm. Is it important to know what the cause is? Will that help you fight that? You know, that I'm so glad that you asked that question because I did want to bring up the fact that like at the beginning of the talk, I sort of, you know, made a little joke about therapy. And I just want to yeah. say like, I think therapy is very important. I actually yeah. do think it's very important to get to the root of what's going on behind certain patterns and certain unconscious behaviors. Uh, so I, I am very pro investigation of that. Um, it's simply that it's not the always the fastest route to mm. changing a behavior. Yeah. And, um, and so I do think it's important. I, you know, I think it's important that we can, can unwind some of these things that are sort of, you know, because some people have a better self image than other people. Um, you know, some of us are more anxious. Some of us have more shame. Some of us, you know, do these things. Some of us have, a, you know, true addiction. Mm -hmm. But the reality is um, this deeper introspection, I think, is easier when you've stopped the behavior. Okay. So I think that it's very useful and very helpful. Um, but it's like if you are addicted to alcohol, there's a lot of deep work to be doing. But you're going to have to create habits that take you away from being able to put a drink to your lips. So the habits change the behaviors. And then some things you might find like are just alleviated and you don't have to do some digging, but sometimes you just know inside that there's still something there for you to learn from. And it would make sense to go back and say like, well, what, what happened there? What was going on? Yeah. Cause it seems to me like it might help you find your, why did I start doing that? And yeah. Maybe even help you set up more friction as you were talking about the, the rubbing it, together. Exactly, exactly. Because sometimes it's like something very small. Like, you know, I have a memory of somebody saying something to me as a child that set up a whole cascade. And like, they had no idea that would be so impactful, but like, it's always what sticks in my head. And so being able to like retrace those steps and know, oh, that was like the core event that like put all this into motion can be very freeing for a lot of us. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, again, thank you so much, Kim. It's a fantastic presentation. Um, yeah. So the ketonist.com, right? Yeah. Uh, no, Kim no. Howerton.com. Kim Although Howerton. the ketonist, yeah, the, it'll get you there too. I've got a okay. backup, but <laughs> Kim Howerton.com is kind of where I'm going. Uh, but the okay. ketonist is all my social media. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, thanks again, Kim. All right. Bye.